everybody, and welcome to this briefing and dialogue uh, on the impact of the Russian war on Ukraine uh, on the financial services industry worldwide. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined uh, with my colleague and friend, uh, Matthew Welch, uh, who is a seasoned banker uh, with tremendous experience in, in the um, transaction banking and capital markets uh, parts of the industry. Uh, and so he will be helping provide some deeper insights uh, so that we're technically correct in what we're saying uh, at this, in, our, in our analysis uh, and uh, also uh, insightful in terms of um, how the financial services industry uh, will be dealing with this crisis and some of the practical issues uh, that will be affecting the industry. Please let me start uh, by, uh, so uh, in the table of contents, we'll be going through payment, supply chain, markets, uh, private banking, uh, and then the dollar, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, ESG, and then a general discussion on the geopolitics. So it is really a lot of ground, okay, between the two of us. The first thing we should both say uh, is how tragic uh, this uh, crisis is. Um, uh, wars are always a horrible thing. Uh, there are pictures of these types of uh, total devastations uh, in previous wars in, in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan, uh, the 2003 attack on, uh, on Iraq and Baghdad. We should have seen pictures like this and we should have felt bad already at that time. Uh, but this time uh, it comes to us uh, graphically. There are journalists on the ground uh, covering the crisis. So we take a moment to you know, uh, share the sorrow of the people who are suffering. I mean, there's nothing that can describe um, the, the, the suffering that is taking place today. Okay, so let's have that at the back of our mind as we go through this discussion. Next. Um, we are very, very grateful, by the way, uh, to have um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Ukrainian ambassador Ambassador to Singapore, uh, Katrina Zelenko, uh, say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Zelenko, for joining us uh, this morning. What is your most important key message to the financial services industry? The most important message is that we are now dealing with the full-fledged war in the very heart of Europe. And um, every community, including the financial one, can contribute to finding a peaceful solution and to stopping this um, senseless war. We are not only speaking about uh, the huge plight of the people on the ground in Ukraine of uh, many deaths and destructions, but we are also speaking about the future of the business communities which need a predictable and secure environment to strike deals, to move forward and to make this planet a safer place to be. Of all the sanctions that have been um, done so far and all of the measures being taken in the financial industry, uh, do you think that it's enough? Uh, there are two sides to the, uh, the response of the finance industry. One is to uh, stop the aggressor and the other is to help the defense of, um, you know, of, of Ukraine. So um, what do you think is missing? Uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done? To begin with, we are grateful to international communities for their sanctions aimed at, uh, at hitting Russia's financial energy and to transport sectors. Um, and um, uh, of course, uh, we can see that more than 400 companies have already left Russian market. However, as we can see, the sanctions imposed are not sufficient enough to stop the further bloodshed. Uh, that is why active um, measures have to be taken in order to achieve more progress on that. We see that only seven out of the top 50 Russian banks have been disengaged from SWIFT. We see that uh, a large number of uh, international companies keep working in Russia, paying taxes. It means that they keep funding this <laughs> terrible military machine. And um, uh, if we look at the structure of the Russian budgets, we can see that every third ruble paid in taxes to Russia um, turn into funding the country's military budget. It means new deaths, new destructions, new injuries in Ukraine. And of course, um, a big issue here is um, uh, oil and natural gas exports, which makes up about 45% of revenues of the Russian federal budget. 
We believe that imposing an immediate ban on Russian oil and other energy imports may stop Russia. We see that there are uh, many meetings and summits uh, going on in Europe these days, and we're hopeful that more and more countries will be willing to contribute to a peaceful solution and to stop in Russia's aggression by banning uh, energy imports from the aggressor country. Do you feel that it is reasonable uh, expectation that the EU might actually uh, join a ban on buying oil and gas from Russia? If you look at the numbers, uh, almost a half of revenues comes from uh, gas and oil business. It will definitely impact uh, Russia's activities towards um, strengthening its military capabilities. That is why we, of course, see that it's going to be a very painful decision. But I think every country is thinking about the future, thinking about a more secure environment for its businesses and for its people, uh, will uh, be willing and will be ready to uh, suffer the short-term pain for the long-term gain. But I think this uh, financial pain is nothing compared to the pain and losses we are suffering now. Losing children, more than 150 children have already been killed in this war. Uh, thousands of civilians have been killed. We have uh, severe destructions of the critical and social infrastructure. So these are losses are irre irreparable. I need everyone needs to keep it in mind. Do you uh, see from your position, uh, you are in Singapore, um, any leakages, any attempts by the financial industry uh, or the supply chain uh, industries to get around sanctions? I think that the situation with many businesses across the globe uh, has become quite unpredictable because we do not know how long this crisis should endure. And of course, uh, it is now clear to everyone that no one will be able to sit out in this terrible war. We already see implications for many countries across the globe, as we need to keep in mind that Ukraine is one of the major exporters of essential food products globally. Think about these uh, factors. We can, of course, come to a conclusion that um, it is crucial for every country, not only in Europe, but also in Asia, in the African countries, in the Middle East, to think about uh, those 400 mil million people across the globe who are now at risk of unstable access to food, malnutrition, uh, and even famine. Russian war threatens to provoke immense spike in prices, food prices, energy prices, which will be of course painful for the citizens. And that is why we cannot allow to tolerate this war. And that's why it is so important for our partners to understand that we need to take joint measures in order to uh, prevent this crisis uh, furthermore. Besides, our country is also a big supplier of uh, different raw materials, chemical products and machinery. It will mean impacts for many industries across the globe. Um, we, of course, see um, support um, by some countries also here in Asia, I think uh, Singapore leads by example. Okay. Yes, because there is a clear understanding in Singapore that uh, in the world where the might is right, no nation can feel safe and uh, no business can feel safe. It means that um, we need more support from also other countries, not only in terms of humanitarian aid, which is also which has been provided by the government of Singapore and by the people in Singapore who donate to the Red Cross, but it is also a matter of um, restrictive measures which can show that um, if the country moves the goalposts, it will be punished because we all need to take care and protect the rules-based order in the international law. Every tenth loaf of bread that is made of Ukrainian wheat. The world has not yet recovered from the COVID pandemic and now we have a more massive challenge which again uh, threatens to disrupt the supply chains, which will be, of course, uh, felt on every corner of the globe. What's the position of the Ukraine government on the support being given uh, by other governments in the emerging markets? Uh, uh, ASEAN as a whole, China, uh, Japan, India, um, and the Middle East. 
Yes, we're grateful to uh, our partners in the countries of Asia Pacific who already imposed sanctions against Russia. So this is uh, along uh, with Singapore, uh, it's Japan, it's been South Korea, um, it was uh, Australia, New Zealand. Um, we have also got um, support in terms of humanitarian aid and financial support from many of these countries, military support as well, which is crucial now for Ukraine to um, strengthen its military capacity as, as we are dealing with a powerful enemy. Um, of course, we need, uh, there is much more which can be done. We have seen that there have been also two statements made by the foreign ministers of the ASEAN countries. And uh, most of the ASEAN countries have also voted in favor of the UNGA resolutions uh, about uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine this new wave of full-scale um, invasion and the second resolution was passed yesterday on the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. So um, there are many ways to support Ukraine. The main uh, thing is that there is of course the goodwill people to contribute to finding a peaceful solution because we see that if we do not um, reach the sustainable ceasefire and if you do not uh, achieve the withdrawal of the troops, we cannot speak about sustainable peace, which means that the situation will endure for longer. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for your comments. Uh, obviously, the Ambassador was somewhat, uh, you know, she was diplomatic because she's a diplomat uh, in terms of the amount of support she's been getting. Uh, but uh, there are countries that have been sort of sort of reticent and she, she didn't mention them very much. Let's start by getting a, a mental picture of uh, what we're dealing with in terms of uh, the size of the respective uh, economies. Uh, as you can see from this list of countries that we've uh, cobbled together, uh, Russia's uh, GDP, which is uh, $1.4 trillion, uh, is about the size uh, of, you know, its, its peers would be South, South Korea, uh, Australia, um, um, Canada is slightly bigger than Russia. And if you look at some of the major economies, um, France is about twice the size of Russia. Germany is about two thirds the size, uh, two, uh, two thirds times larger than Russia. Um, and then, um, uh, and and you have India, which is also uh, much larger than, than Russia. So um, I think one of the interesting things here is that Russia plays this role as a superpower, but actually its economy is about the same size as Australia. The reason is that the, all the money in Russia is taken by the Russian government and disproportionately <laughs> goes into uh, military and, and all the rest of that. But as an economy, it's it's about the same size as Australia or and a bit smaller than South Korea. In fact, um, what you said just now, that all the money is taken by the state. So state-run economies tend to look larger than they are because uh, there's a consolidation of the assets mm. uh, uh, around the state. Uh, and in the, in the case of Russia, around the oligarchs. Yes, if you look at the number of very rich billionaires out of Russia, you'd think it was a very rich country. But actually, it's just that the billionaires have a disproportionately large... And we're coming to that in a, in a, okay. in a while, right? And then uh, Ukraine uh, is... Um, uh, um, a sizable economy, but, um, you know, uh, much larger than um, uh, many countries, but uh, quite interestingly, uh, smaller than its neighbors, like Poland, for example, it's much larger than, uh, uh, than Ukraine. Pakistan is much larger than Ukraine. Ukraine is a $150 billion economy, roughly, where Russia is a $1.5 trillion economy. So the comparison between the two of them, Russia, although we said Russia is only the size of Australia, but it's 10 times bigger than Ukraine. And Ukraine isn't a large economy in the in the world. Yes, uh, it's strategically important for food security for itself, as well as for a number of countries that are not even related to Ukraine. And for the population of its size, it is a pretty decent and, and uh, sustainable economy in, in, that way, in that sense. Both economies are very strongly dependent on commodities. In the case of Russia, uh, it's essentially a 73% uh, fuels and mining 
mining's economy, basically. Uh, and that's what gives Russia the confidence uh, to be able to you know, pursue this war in the way that it does, because uh, uh, it has many client states uh, which are dependent on it. Um, and if you look at uh, uh, the major trading partners, uh, the next slide, please. Here, what's interesting is both Russia and uh, Ukraine have something in common. Both of them have China uh, as their major, the most important trading partner uh, on the on the import and the export side. Um, on the export side, China is the largest export market for Russia, and it takes about fifteen percent. Russian export for Ukraine. The uh, export side, fourteen percent, fifteen percent for Russia and China. Uh, and in, to China and uh, and in eleven percent uh, Ukraine, Ukraine to, to China. China. Because although China is very important to Russia with fourteen point six percent, fifteen percent of its exports, but of course it doesn't work the other way around. Russia is really quite small for China's exports. So China is big for Russia, but Russia, I think, is only like uh, three or three or four percent of the exports of Russia. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, so strategically, uh, Russia does not even feature in uh, in China's uh, uh, important uh, as an export Import destination, aid, which uh, will affect uh, how China, um, you know, prioritizes. How, to what extent it's going to be able to help Russia. So everything that we are hearing about, you know, uh, China being, um, you know, very helpful to Russia, uh, it'll cost China a lot uh, if it, um, you know, loses that relationship with Europe and, and the US. It doesn't make China sense. to support Russia. Okay. So, um, and then let's go on to the next slide. We listed uh, the banks that are significantly exposed to um, the, uh, to Russia. Okay, at, at this point, uh, there are three types of exposures. There are banks that are exposed uh, just through their lending, their, their lending book. Uh, there are banks that are exposed on the capital, uh, so their capital is uh, extensively um, affected. Uh, and and then there are banks that are exposed on the trading book, uh, derivatives and so on. So the bank that is most affected on the lending book is uh, UniCredit, um, um, which which actually had to push the core capital ratio uh, down to 13% uh, from about 15%. So uh, that's where uh, it hits some of the European banks. Uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the most exposed banks have been be Raiffeisen, SocGen, and UniCredit. And I think the reason for that is that each of those three banks has actually had businesses within Russia. So that's where they've got quite a lot of balance sheet exposure. Either directly or uh, through subsidiary institutions. Mm -hmm. It's all subsidiaries, I think. Yeah. Uh, Top yeah. Um, had Ross Bank, for example. Uh, yeah. Pfizer also had... Uh, yeah, so it's either their own, their own wholly owned subsidiaries, or like in the case of Ross Bank, uh, a subsidiary that they own. So, um, so the moment they're on the ground, the the bank with the largest uh, uh, exposure, the American bank with the largest exposure, it seems to be, uh, is Citibank. Most of the other banks are, are sort of marginally uh, exposed to Russia. Um, um, they, they are, the, the French banks are, are mostly loan books, basically. Yes, and I think the other thing to note is that where banks have large exposures in Russia because they have businesses in Russia, I, I guess it's Basel free, right? But under the, the new guidelines, they typically their funding and their lending is all within Russian borders. So the, the cross-border exposure is a very different question, which is obviously why we were pushed in that direction of, of, of subsidiary banks having their own uh, funding and capital within countries so that actually it doesn't impact the parent as much as it otherwise would have. And the sense I get is uh, uh, from the time of the Crimean War, which was Crimean War, which is in 2014, the, the Russian regulators have been trying to force the foreign banks to be locally incorporated. So actually that reduces the risk to everybody. Right, yeah. yeah. And, um, and city's exposure uh, is said to be about $9.8 billion, uh, mostly because again, it's the one American bank that is uh, locally incorporated. Uh, and it's been trying to sell its, uh, you know, retail franchise for the last year, and I guess this is not a time to to sell anything. Um, and and uh, so that's the exposure that City has. 
Um, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs have been sort of circumspect in the way they've been describing their Russian exposure. Uh, it's there. Uh, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs flagged uh, credit exposure of 650 million, uh, and JP Morgan says it's got 160 staff. So very, um, not very clear in terms quite, of quite minor exposures. Uh, you would almost think surprisingly small exposures. Yeah, uh, and I guess the American banks tend to do much better in dollar clearing, so they don't really need to get on the ground unless you're Citibank. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. Uh, payments, the, the impact of on SWIFT member institutions. Um, because of the coverage that you get in the general newspapers, uh, you might imagine that, uh, that the US or the EU uh, has a direct bearing on how uh, SWIFT works and, and, uh, and you know, they, they influence SWIFT uh, directly. Uh, they do influence SWIFT. Uh, but there's a technical process in which it works that we need to be uh, very clear about. Um, you know, when we when we deal about pay, when we deal with payments. Um, so um, the first thing I want to say: the banks that have been sanctioned uh, or rather have been uh, have had their SWIFT accounts frozen. Uh, there are well, seven banks that are that have been uh, that have been flagged, um, and six of them are actually very minor banks. Okay, bank. Uh, Okriki, uh, Novicom Bank, uh, from Yas Bank, Bank Rosia, uh, Softcom Bank, um, uh, Neshcom Como Bank. Uh, these are very, very uh, small players. The only bank in that list which is of some significance uh, is VTP Bank, which has about 20% uh, of the assets, uh, of the total assets of the banking sector in, in, in Russia. And Russia has got about 333 banks. The two banks that they that we need to flag and watch very clearly, which are not being um, uh, not being sanctioned or not being uh, you know frozen on their SWIFT accounts, uh, are Spur Bank um, and uh, Gazprom Bank. Um, Spur Bank. Spur Bank is something like thirty percent of the deposit and asset base, and uh, VTB Bank I think is another twenty. Twenty percent. Oh, so, together they are fifty percent. So, so they got one bank but not the other. Yeah, it's like three hundred. 30 banks in Russia, so there's a large number of small banks. Right. Um, I just, so the, so there's, the, there's different things. The two banks that were not impacted by SWIFT but are very influential are Spare Bank, which is sort of the equivalent of uh, well, Savings Bank. It's the old, everybody had an account. It's like DBS in Singapore and uh, Gazprom Bank. And of course, the reason for that is Gazprom Bank and Spare Bank are the banks through which Europe pays for its oil and gas, which has not been sanctioned. Right. Uh, and although there is no swift uh, freezing of Spare Bank, uh, the US has uh, disallowed US institutions for having any correspondent banking relationship with them. So, which means that um, Spare Bank would not be able to do dollar clearing uh, on any network uh, that involves uh, US bank on the other side of the deal. Correct, but the Europeans will still be able to pay for their oil and gas in euros. Or any currency they want, right? So Not dollars. And uh, yeah, as long as it doesn't get cleared to to the US or a US counterparty. Well, I think we've got to be careful, right? Because there's the, the uh, SWIFT, technically, I think it's not a sanction. It's just that they've been frozen out of SWIFT. But then there's a whole set of different sanctions that's going to affect all, 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 all the banks that, are, that we deal with. So you've got G7 sanctions, you've got the US sanctions, which are expressed through OFAC and what you're talking about with uh, Spare Bank. Uh, you've got EU sanctions, and then you've also got other individual country sanctions. So specifically, you've got UK sanctions, and we're sitting in Singapore, and, and Singapore. usually there are also Singapore Central. sanctions. So whether or not a bank is or is not frozen out of SWIFT, there's still a bewildering array of different sanctions that we as bankers have to think about to make sure that we don't do something wrong. 
it's, it's a very complicated situation. And uh, from the last we've heard from SWIFT, uh, the Russian banks are still members of SWIFT. Okay, so uh, what they what they don't get to do is they don't get to use the messaging system. Having said that, there are two other messaging systems which are available to the Russians. Their, their own system called uh, SPFS, which is uh, a system for transfer of financial messages run by the Russian Central Bank, uh, and SIPS, which is run by China, China. right? So, and, and uh, SPFS already accounts for 25% of uh, money flows uh, for domestic banks in, in Russia. So, um, uh, and there are foreign uh, participants uh, in SPFS. So that's uh, another way around um, um, you know, it's the payments loophole, loophole yeah. uh, that still functions basically, but that's only as good as the amount of liquidity that's available in that network. Um, so if you deal in rubles, And I think the point that you were making earlier, ED, which is a very important point, is that what the US Treasury did do was to ban, uh, uh, it imposed so called CAPTA, CAPTA yeah. sanctions yeah. on Spare Bank. And so Although that, Spare Bank is still acting in SWIFT and fully blocked VTB. So the US Treasury, CAPTA is, sorry, I have to <laughs> read this, we're all learning about sanctions as we go. CAPTA is correspondent account and payable through account sanctions, C A P T A. So they did that for Spare Bank, the US, and they did a full blocking on. VTB. So what that means is that no U.S. bank can deal with spare bank or VTB. So to the extent that another bank elsewhere us? in the world is sending payments in dollars that normally would go through the U.S., can't be done. What's also interesting about the payments sanctions that have been taking place so far is that the announcements were made uh, in the early part of March, uh, but the, the sanctions or rather the, uh, the, the blockages... The, the Russia-related directive from OFAC, which is to say the US sanctions, I think were to take effect beginning March 26th. So they gave people a bit of time to figure out what they had to do in order to give effect to these sanctions. Right, and, and so it was up to uh, as many banks there are as there are around the world uh, to decide um, how they wanted to use this period to do to clear out any of their existing payments uh, instructions and so on uh, and not take on new ones uh, and there have been banks uh, which have uh, sort of tried to profit from this whole relationship by um, you know by looking out for loopholes in the in the system what we're talking about here principally at this point is payments which you have to remember there are a bunch of other sanctions that we'll talk about later that aren't specifically payments yeah. related but which might affect payments that somebody might to do. Okay. For instance, you couldn't make a payment to a sanctioned oligarch. It bears saying none of us can really understand the implications of what's going on, uh, both with the war itself and the disruptions to supply chains and the, the secondary effects of these various sanctions and, and, and countermeasures. Um, I suspect will be extremely significant in all kinds of areas and we can't even begin to know what they are. Uh, but I mean, sitting here in Singapore, our electricity bills are going up and it's partly because of all of this. So it reaches everywhere in the world. The, um, some of the things that were talked about earlier by the, uh, by the ambassador, the Ukrainian ambassador in uh, Singapore, Ambassador Zelenka, is that uh, Ukraine is a very significant producer of agricultural commodities. So wheat, corn, uh, sunflower oil, and I believe soybeans. Russia is also. So if you look at um, traded grains, uh, Ukraine might be broadly, say, 20% of world wheat, traded wheat. Russia might be another 15%. So if you put it together, and by the way, you might also include Belarus. Uh, ED, we didn't talk about Belarus, but that's also um, falling into this. Uh, so the, the disruptions to supply are going to be absolutely huge. It's, it's something like could be a third of traded wheat, for example. I think in terms of sunflower oil, 
Ukraine, I seem to recall, is 47% of world production. And it's also extremely significant in funny things like honey. So um, uh, agricultural commodity-wise, extremely problematic. We can, we can expect uh, spikes in the prices of uh, these food crops. Corn, of course, is, is, is mostly exported and used as a pig feed in China. We people eat it in their bread, as the ambassador said. So you'll you'll get pork prices going up in 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 China and all the rest of that. Then there's a there's a there's a secondary impact on food production. Just while we're on the on the matter of food production, which is that um, uh, to grow food you need a fertilizer. So a lot of fertilizer. Uh, it comes from potash, ammonia. Uh, Belarus is one of the, the significant uh, producers of, of potash. Uh, other, otherwise, feedstock for fertilizer is natural gas and so on. So, okay. yeah. yeah. So um, fertilizer prices are likely to go up. And that in the US. Everywhere yeah, in the but, world. But the US being a major uh, exporter of food uh, yes, will yes, be yes, affected yes, yes, because yes, yes, of yes. the war. Yeah. So farmers all over the world are either going to have to pay more for their fertilizer, or what's more likely in the in the developing markets, um, they'll use less fertilizer. And so that, that'll be a, a huge secondary impact on a reduction in global production of, of grains and agricultural commodities, leading to price rises. Now, last time this happened, we had the Arab Spring because a lot of these grains that come out of the Black Sea, they go into the Mediterranean, they get sold to uh, Egypt as a huge importer of, of Ukrainian grain, and uh, they've already got problems with their budget because they have to subsidize the bread. Lebanon, Syria, all these countries. So you're going to see uh, political disruption there. Additionally, um, there's um, uh, neon gas, uh, which is very largely produced by Ukraine for the world. And you need neon gas for the photolithography when you're making computer chips. So there's, there's going to be shortages of that. Um, if you look at Russia, uh, platinum, aluminum, or aluminium, as we say in Britain, uh, nickel, shortages. So things are, prices are going to go up. Uh, transport routes. We've got uh, we've, we're more and more people were sending trains from China to Europe. Well, they mostly went through Ukraine. So obviously, war going on is going to stop. So cost of transport is going to go up, and there'll be further supply chain disruptions. Aviation. The airspace of Russia is very largely closed to other countries' airlines, and Russian airlines aren't allowed to fly into, I think, EU airspace at this point. So very weird. If you look at the, the sort of flight tracker, there's this great big hole where Ukraine and Belarus are. There's, there's no planes. There's, I mean, it's go slightly beyond supply chain, but there's 650 planes in Russia, which are all leased. The sanctions, so we say sanctions go beyond payments, uh, mean that the, the leasing companies, which are largely based in Ireland, have had to ask for their planes back. And naturally, Mr. Putin has said no. <laughs> so what happens? Uh, who pays for the 650 planes? You can't get them out. I think one flew out and was impounded. So. Um, uh, by the way, just on aviation, because obviously it's a big part of it. But nowadays with a plane, you don't just buy a plane and operate it. Uh, General Electric or, or whoever, or Rolls-Royce, continuously monitor and support the engines. So they won't be able to do that with the Russian planes. So the, the knock-on impact on supply chains in terms of transport infrastructure, but also in terms of commodities, agricultural commodities, metals, it could be huge. I mean, if the war ends tomorrow, maybe it all settles down. But if the war drags on, this could be very significant. For automobile production in Europe, they, they, they were making certain parts in Ukraine. Now they can't get those parts. So um, I, I'll, I'll stop there. But suffice to say, it's almost impossible at this point to work out how big it is. But it's probably bigger than people understand in terms of global destruction. So where earlier you said Ukraine is just a $150 billion economy, sort of, I mean, we care about the people, but why do we care about the economics of it? And the answer to that is because it's very significant in certain commodities.
with the tail that wags the dog. Yes. Um, in two years, if you get a, a you get a you know a crisis or a revolution in in Egypt or Sudan, uh, it's yes. because you know wheat Rain prices went went up. Grain prices went up. If you see, there's a you know there's a flashback in uh, in the Midwest in the U.S. It's because the farmers cannot afford. And sorry, I missed the biggest one of all, of course, which is oil and gas, because the um, the huge impact is uh, Russian oil and gas exports being stopped by sanctions, and uh, and those exports from and through Ukraine, and as we know, Ukraine and Russia provide i think it's 30 to 40 percent of the gas in europe and a very significant portion of the um of the petroleum products right both crude so we'll come to that when we talk about esg um you know and uh, meeting the cop 26 but that also will have huge impact because there'll either be shortages and i, I saw in austria uh yesterday they were already rationing diesel or price increases, uh, which feeds through into the price of everything, inflation. Right. So there's going to be inflation in Europe as a consequence of the supply chain disruptions from this Ukrainian war. Right. The knock-on effect uh, of the supply chains uh, are far more profound than we realize. Um, and when you think of something as simple as the microchip, where Russia doesn't um, you know, show up in any of the data on the production of microchip. But Ukraine uh, makes them more Neon. Russia and Ukraine uh, produce uh, bits and bits bits of the components uh, that can slow down the entire process. So that's that's how profound uh, the impact is on uh, on supply yeah. chain. Let's move on uh, markets and commodity prices, right? So uh, the knock-on effect of supply chain uh, has uh, seen itself uh, in the uh, in the rise of commodity prices, uh, and uh, the way I see it, um, this entire war. Uh, will have a profound effect on the future of the industry itself, the financial services industry. Why? For example, when nickel prices went shot up through the roof, there, there was one day where the London Metals Exchange uh, had a, a, a blip, uh, uh, a profound rise that affected one of its participating members who was trying to short uh, the market on that same day. Okay, and it was a Chinese player. Chinese guy, right? right? Uh, and what the LME did was to freeze all of the uh, transactions for that day uh, and cancel them. Okay, uh, and as a result, uh, which you never do on a commodities exchange, and you never you do on a back and say on an, all the on an exchange, the uh, and it raised a lot of issues uh, related to the integrity of the London Metals Exchange. It is owned by the Hong Kong Exchange, uh, and so on, uh, and and uh, and governance, and and so on. So you can see that uh, the knock-on effect on on uh, in institutions, financial institutions, is profound already. Uh, and then uh, the repercussions to reconstruct the trust, the integrity, and the new technologies that are coming through uh, to move us out of exchanges uh, will have a, you know, will, will be justifiable uh, going into the future. So I think that uh, you know, in terms of the uh, effect on the future of the financial services industry and some of the new uh, platforms that will come through as a result of this war uh, will be quite uh, um, you know important to watch. To all know but it's worth repeating, is that um, this is a supply chain crisis on top of a supply chain crisis. Because we've already had the COVID supply chain crisis. And now we've got a new supply chain crisis on top of that. The sovereign debt uh, crisis. Russia owes foreign creditors $62.5 billion, uh, including $21.5 billion that requires repayment in dollars and euro. Okay, uh, And there are a number of uh, important payment dates coming through, uh, the first of which was $117 million payment of US-denominated debt that was due on the 23rd of March. I thought that the, that one, their problem was a different one, which is interesting and it shows how you can't quite predict how these things are going to work. I think Russia was trying to pay its bond and the problem was when they sent the dollars for the payment on the bond, the intermediary banks refused to, uh, refused to that. take them. And then they offered so to pay. Russia was actually it. trying to pay their interest yes. payment. Now, my understanding was that that one was actually paid uh, and so that's, we passed it, but it shows how 
is sort of an unintended consequence of the other sanctions that Russia could be forced into default. Uh, and it's not a will, you know, willingness to pay issue. It's they, in that case, they nearly couldn't pay because they couldn't transfer the dollars to the paying agent. But your point about rubles, I think, is, is, is a slightly different one where they were saying, I think Mr. Putin was saying that he wanted for payments of the gas that he's still supplying to Europe. And of course, this is a big elephant in the room. The EU, Europe, is still buying a huge amount of Ukrainian gas, and they typically pay for it in euros. And uh, the problem was that Mr. Putin said he wanted to be paid in rubles, which would have forced the European countries to go out and buy rubles, which would have supported the ruble. But they've all basically, as I understand it, said no, on the grounds that there are contracts, and the contract doesn't allow for payment in rubles, so they're going to continue to pay in euros. So that that idea that he could make people pay for his gas in, in rubles, I think, is full through. But that also could almost have been argued to be default on the contract. The world's largest fund manager, BlackRock, uh, had uh, had to write off $18.2 billion in Russian assets that it had at the beginning of this year. The Russian stock market has gone to nothing. On, uh, the, on, on the UK exchange, they're not trading the GDRs any longer. Right. And I presume the things are not being traded on the US exchange. The institutions and countries holding Russian reserves, the UK, uh, international institutions, and then the US, Germany, Japan, France, and China, um, uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, all of them, but uh, of course, uh, Ch China being the largest holder of uh, Russian reserves outside of Russia, right? Uh, so um, that sort of gives you a profile of uh, uh, of the um, the spread of the Russian um, reserves around the world. China, I think, has about three trillion in reserves. Last time I looked, it might have gone up. And as you say, Russia has 643 billion, I think, as of February the 18th. But this is also an extraordinary new development that nobody would have predicted, which is that the G7 have basically frozen Russia's reserves. So I think when um, uh, Russia went into this business of invading Ukraine, surely they would have said, what's the worst that can happen? What can they do to us? And probably some yes men told Mr. Putin, don't worry. But what actually has happened is that these reserves have been effectively frozen. Yep. Um, Which is new. I mean, who, who believed that could happen? What tools does the Bank of Russia have to stabilize the financial system uh, now that we are actually uh, uh, you know, on well, the topic of reserves? That's yeah. a very interesting question. Yeah. And I think that, as I, as I said, I believe that when... Um, Russia invaded Ukraine, they obviously would have done a scenario analysis and said, what could happen? What sort of sanctions could we expect? And uh, Mr. Putin would have asked his generals or his analysts, you know, can we um, you know, sustain what they would do to us? But nobody ever thought, because it hasn't really um, been done before, that the reserves of Russia would be frozen. So we've got a breakdown, I think, don't we, uh, ED, of where the reserves of, of where the 640 billion are. And broadly, I think it's 32% in euros, 21% in dollars. Uh, I think it's about 16% in gold and a bit less in Chinese yuan. And as, as, if I understand it correctly, broadly, the, the dollars and the euros have been frozen. So when they launched this war, they expected, Mr. Putin expected that he had 650 billion of reserves. He could support the ruble. And then he finds it's effectively confiscated. And, and that's new. So the only part of it I think that he can easily use is the renminbi, which is sitting in China, which is a relatively small portion and isn't internationally usable, and the gold. And what has happened very recently, as in yesterday, or, or, or it might even have been this morning, uh, uh, the the gold oh, yeah. Is it frozen? Yeah. has been well you can't freeze gold i suppose but what what uh, the us has said and i think the uk has said is you you may not um trade with you they're, they're, they're cutting the the russian counterparties out of the london metal exchange and out of the 
the, the US exchanges. So basically, you can't sell your gold, which is precisely because he had, he had his dollars, he had his euros frozen, but he's got his renminbi and his gold, and now they're freezing the renminbi and the gold. So to the question of how can they stabilize the situation, it's extraordinarily difficult, and which is why the ruble has gone down 30%. I mean, it moves around a lot. And obviously, to the extent that people in Russia are, are using imports, the price of those imports so people are talking about 20% inflation in Russia. So quite feasible. So logically, uh, the tools that they have, uh, one is to try and get around payments as much as possible. Second is... Support the currency with the reserves, reserve. but it can't. It can't. So the currency goes down. So what they, they have done is they've uh, in, increased uh, interest rates. It's gone up to 20%, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so um, so the, the one of the tools available to the central bank is interest rates. Uh, if you want to stabilize your currency, currency you can raise your interest rates. But obviously, in the medium the term, if you're a company, and suddenly you're paying 20% on your debt, so while well, you go bust. So for this, we look for guidance in countries like Iran uh, and Turkey, uh, which had similar situations uh, you know, uh, that they faced. Uh, Iran with the sanctions of the US, uh, 10 years ago now. And, um, and what and, happened in the Iranian case when uh, the Americans sanctioned them? What happened to their oil? A lot of the oil went bl black market. That's, uh, you know, there were lots of uh, ghost ships going around the world carrying Iranian uh, oil and, and trading on, on, uh, on, on, the, on the, 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 the shadow market, market, the gray market, right? Uh, and, and then, of course, China was a big absorber of uh, Iranian oil. Uh, so uh, that sort of stabilized the Iranian economy. The GDP fell like fifty percent. So it's not it's not uh, the impact. Was... Didn't their oil production also fall? Fall as a result. One of the other things was they didn't have the technical capacity to maintain the oil wells. So over time, when Halliburton and all these um, folks don't go in and, and help them, the capacity goes down. Um, but, but so who will buy the Russian oil, ED? Uh, well, that's the deal that uh, Russia signed with China before the before the uh, the war started, which is uh, a non unlimited uh, uh, you know uh, relationship, economic relationship. So uh, China will absorb as much as it can, I, I think. And, and I think India also. And and India. Well, what the Indians are saying is that. Uh, the uh, buying Russian oil is being done by the private sector corporations, which are getting a discount uh, if they pay in Indian rupees to the Russians. So they get a 20% uh, discount. Uh, you yeah, know. So my understanding is the oil on this sort of market is, is, is I think it's 20% less than market price. And then in addition, the Russians will have the problem of getting paid. They'll get paid in rupees. And some of it is barter. So, uh, in fact, Russia already has very good barter relationships with a number of countries, India being one of them, uh, Malaysia, and so on. So, um, so there are mechanics that, uh, mechanisms that are, you know, that can be triggered. But of course, at the moment, Russian oil and gas is being sold to Europe. Germany is buying it, paying in euros, and the, the, the funds flows go through their bank. As they always have done. And that was the point the Ukrainian ambassador was, ambassador was making, which is, please, Europe, stop buying Russian oil and gas. I know it'll be painful. Um, but uh, I mean, she was saying that it, um, it's painful anyway, and that would solve this difficult problem. Private banking, um, Russian billionaires control 30% of the nation's wealth. Uh, 23 billionaires account for $343 billion. You know, that number, by the way, is nothing. Um, one uh, public listed company in China is about $300 billion, or at least uh, dot com companies are. Uh, and uh, But offshore, I think the overall number is about $800 billion, isn't mm -hmm. that right? Because a lot of the Wealth is in property and so forth. So I, again, talking about un, 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 unquantifiable impact, the city of London um, has lived off Russian oligarchs putting their money through it, buying houses, uh, using London lawyers to set up BVI companies with own their yachts. So this is where famously uh, Roman Abramovich has been told he has to give up his ownership in Chelsea. 
<laughs> right, <laughs> which uh, is a matter of angst in the UK at the moment. Uh, the Swiss Bankers Association says that it holds uh, the, that its private banks hold about 213 billion uh, uh, US dollars of Russian money, uh, which which accounts if you take 800 800 to a trillion uh, as being the total net worth of Russian oligarchs, um, um, 213 is, is a pretty is a significant amount. So a lot of it is actually anchored in Switzerland. And then, of course, all of the other um, financial uh, the markets around the world. Um, Credit Suisse said that it has a gross credit exposure of 1.5, 1.7 billion to Russia. Uh, um, I think that that is at a private banking uh, level. So um, that gives you an idea. UBS says that it has 640, 34 million, which is very small um, and maybe not very indicative. But I think also in the private banking world, I was talking to the CEO of one, the Asia CEO of one Swiss private bank this morning. And he says part of the problem is it isn't completely clear what you can and can't do. For example, the, the, the European Union has, I think, instituted rules that if you're not an EU resident Russian, you can't have a bank account in the EU. And so obviously, if you're a Russian in Russia, that means you can no longer have a bank account in the EU. But it's unclear if you're a, a not Russian resident Russian, are you allowed to have a bank account in the EU? So the even as we're trying to explain some of the impacts of this, people in the Swiss banking industry themselves are unclear how to interpret the rules. Because a lot of them have come out and they're very, very broad. So the banks don't really know what they can and can't do. Do they have to close all Russian bank accounts in Europe? of non-EU resident Russians? Yeah, what? so know. the legality of uh, freezing um, accounts of uh, high net worth individuals operates at three levels. One is the country sanctions them and says, you know, freeze the accounts. The second is that you got to, you, you actually have to uh, have a legal basis for that, meaning that, and, and the legal basis in most cases are uh, because of criminality, not because of a war or something that is not related to them. So, so the the banking system has to go out and prove uh, the criminality of of uh, of the assets, uh, and then the third is enforceability, which in some cases uh, in the past have taken up to fifteen years, uh, you know, and and some oligarchs are able to um, you know to fight their way through because they have the best lawyers in the world. So, so there will be a three stage and process. All of their assets are not held and all of the in their own are... name, right? They're all held through different companies. So proving who owns a given asset is highly complex. So I think at this point, we simply don't know. But to, 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 to the point, a, a, a next level of difficult sanctions for banks is that there's these named oligarchs have been sanctioned, but then Japan has frozen the assets of an additional 17 Russian individuals named individuals. And then, I, as I understand it, the US has sanctioned all 300 members of the Duma, the Russian parliament. And that was, I think, yesterday. So it's, it's really a moving target. You don't know. So they, they need to go through the processes. Uh, sanctioning is it's the easy part. Um, you know, enforcing is the difficult well, part. The problem is our banks are the ones that have to do it. And by the way, where Singapore came out with its own uh, sanctions, uh, my understanding is, that again, talking to Singapore bankers yesterday, they, they, they were grateful because they said the MAS told us very clearly what we can and what we can't do. So now we know and we get on with business. So for instance, if you're, if you're in Singapore and if I've got a, 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 a young uh, friend, a friend of mine has a friend who's a young man who's a student in Moscow and he needs to pay his rent. He's a student, he needs 500 bucks a month. Can I send the 500 bucks to that fellow in Moscow? Apparently, yes, I can. But th then your problem will be, uh, practically, the Singapore banker told me, you're going to have to show an awful lot of documentation that the fellow is a student, that there's his rent. So if you're not already a customer, uh, or you haven't already been sending the, 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 the money, so the, the good thing about the Singapore sanctions was it, it made clear what you can do. 
Right. I think uh, it's going to have a profound impact on private banking, on the cost of private banking, uh, on the KYC and uh, governance of private banking uh, for a long time to come. Uh, and uh, this war uh, makes private banking almost untenable, basically. Uh, you know, well, I think what we'll see is different banks will decide: is it worth? Is it worth banking Russians? And I mean, no, the, 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 all these things we're saying, by the way, of course, the vast majority of Russian people are good people and and try to make a living and have families and do normal things. And we've all got Russian friends, right? So uh, I don't wish harm on, on those ordinary Russians. But you can see why it, banks are going to just say it's just too difficult. And we're in Singapore. Russia isn't a big part of our business. We're just not going to do it. Right. And in fact, any interim measures uh, between the parties, between Russia, Ukraine, the US, and, and Europe, uh, will actually confuse them, will muddy the water even more. Unless it is, as you say, the regulators have to be clear uh, in, in what their. Can you do? What can you do? And you can you pay do? your employees in Moscow? You can send money to your young student fellow who needs to pay his rent. Right. Okay. Uh, you can you can you can apparently send money, I think, to to withdraw assets. So that I mean, you know, one will need to read very carefully the the MAS guidance, which is on their website. But of course, every country has got its own all these issues. But then you also need to understand the US sanctions, all the G7 sanctions, right. the EU sanctions, all and so on. Future of the dollar. I think there's been a lot of discussion on, uh, you know, is, is this crisis or is this war uh, weakening uh, the hold of the US dollar uh, over time? Uh, I think that all the data suggests uh, not in any way. Uh, I think it reinforces the need for very deep liquidity in global markets in, in order to pay, be able to pay bills. Uh, and the Chinese renminbi is nowhere near there. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is the fourth uh, largest uh, traded currency uh, on, on SWIFT uh, and on Forex, but, but it's, but it's it, massively smaller, smaller than, than the, 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 the big ones, dollar, right? Yeah. Um, and massively, it's, it's still dollar-centric. Um, so firstly, a country has to provide liquidity into the global market. Secondly, they need to have um, you know, a, um, open, a capital open, account. open capital account, right? So, and thirdly, they need to have a, a system that is used broadly and widely, uh, a payment network. So um, uh, on, that, on those three counts, uh, the dollar will still be uh, a strong, and on top of that, uh, you know, the U.S. economy is creating even more liquidity through uh, bond purchases and so on. So, um, you know, which is globalized because, um, you know, it's, it is perceived to be the, the best held, um, you know, foreign reserves. So uh, for all those reasons, I think the dollar uh, is unassailable at the moment. Um, well, I think you've got short term and long term, right? In the short term, unassailable as a, as a means of payment. You know, it's almost the only game in town. In the long term, I think these these uh, effective freezing of the uh, foreign reserves of Russia will make a lot of countries suddenly sit up and think, "Goodness, I didn't realize that my my six hundred forty billion could be frozen." Because it, it I, uh, earlier, I think I, I said it hasn't really happened before. I mean. It has happened in some instances. Afghanistan, I think, had six and a half billion of foreign reserves, which were also frozen. And in that one, which is uh, by the by the US, and uh, obviously because they don't recognize the, the Taliban government, and in that one, which was quite a troubling precedent, um, whatever you think about Afghanistan, the US then said, we're going to take the six billion, and we're going to use three billion of it to give it to NGOs and help people of Afghanistan. And we're going to give three billion of it to 9/11 survivors mm. and their uh, family. I mean, 9/11 victims' families, which is a very troubling precedent because I think in the past, when countries' reserves have been frozen, they sit there, and then one day uh, they get given back to them. But in that Afghanistan case, they seem to be saying they can be frozen and deployed. So in the long term, I think countries are going to be much more cautious about using, uh, putting their reserves in dollars 
and that might be good for gold. Um, although, as we're as we're seeing, even gold is having its issues now that gold has also been effectively Russian gold has been effectively sanctioned. Which brings us to the next topic, uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we did not uh, detect any uh, direct linkages uh, between the war uh, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, in fact, the crypto uh, weakened uh, in, in the period uh, during the war. Uh, and uh, and it's, crypto is, uh, is actually dictated by other uh, uh, issues uh, related to the technology. Um, so Ethereum, for example, uh, is waiting for new technology in order to be able to you know, transact faster and so on, and it's been delayed. Uh, and, and then you have uh, Bitcoin, uh, which is creating a market all of its own uh, that is sort of a proxy for equities um, and uh, equities and, uh, and the dollar, actually. So um, uh, it's Ukraine interesting. has raised money. Apparently, I think they've raised $100 million has been given to Ukraine in cryptocurrency which they've been using for their own so the one good thing you can say about crypto is that it's being used as opposed to it's being uh, kept as an asset. I think that uh, for the most part, I, I think it's about 70% of all crypto uh, is stored as a, as a, a store of value of assets, uh, not necessarily used for transactions. So it's situations like this that forces uh, the use of crypto for payments and uh, you will see a lot more liquidity created, but it's not showing up in the numbers yet. No, but I think, again, the implications of this thing for crypto could be quite profound, because to the extent that the uh, or large section of the international community is trying to stop certain financial flows to and from Russia, um, the whole thing about crypto is uh, no government tells us what to do. We're completely independent of governments, and so we're not going to shut down. We're going to keep allowing payments to be made in crypto. So if they do that to any material extent, they're going to find that they will get shut down. In fact, in two regulated. months' time, I, I will be going into Honduras, Honduras to, to go and see how crypto is used uh, at the street level. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, activity in crypto setting up uh, merchant acceptance uh, in countries like Hondur Honduras, uh, Venezuela, Zimbabwe. Uh, and, I, and I guess that when the war ends, uh, when when uh, when Ukraine is rebuilding, uh, there's no reason crypto will not be, um, you know, a an important uh, well, transaction. Again, mechanism. we have a different perspective of this, and indeed we have a question from the floor of can crypto provide a means to evade the sanctions? And you see, what I'm saying is, in the short term, uh, probably yes. Um, but if that happens a lot, then all these crypto guys are going to find themselves regulated, aren't they? Yes. Uh, having said that, I think uh, it was uh, to Kraken and uh, Binance, by the way, uh, CZ, who is now world famous for getting around regulators, uh, promised to uh, you know rid rid Binance of all Russian investors. So so there's a kind of a commitment to you know to be regulated and to keep to keep to the straight and narrow. Uh, I think Coinbase said they would refuse. Coinbase, and then Coinbase refused. Coinberry and, all said that and they do said, not plan to shut out Russian-based accounts, resisting pressure to join the that's correct. efforts. So the crypto industry is formulating its responses at the moment, uh, and there will be kind of a, a regulatory backlash, uh, you know, if they take that uh, view. Uh, why they're taking that view is not very clear yet, actually, by the way, uh, at least not to me. So, you know. Uh, why are the, the platforms saying that, you know, they're not going to go out and look for Russians in, in their investor base? Oh, I think philosophically, uh, they all were saying our whole raison d'etre is that we're not regulated by governments. Uh, where they're regulated... So then when governments want to regulate them philosophically, they should well, say no. Where they're regulated and where they are legal, uh, they have uh, started complying with KYC and so on. So, uh, and then to say that they don't, they don't, they will specifically not 
uh, exclude Russians uh, is interesting. So that's a space to be uh, to watch. Uh, and at the moment, it's very speculative. Uh, why is the crypto industry taking this kind of a position? And as I said, the one guy who should have been a lot more, um, you know, randy on about uh, about um, you know accepting Russians uh, turned out to be the one that says that he will uh, abide by regulation. So let's see how that goes. Okay, ESG. Uh, the next slide. Um, so quite clear. Uh, the banking industry is going to find it really difficult uh, to keep to its COP26 commitments. Uh, firstly, it's got to do with lending uh, to uh, war rehabilitation needs, uh, reconstruction and so on. And a lot of that is going to be oil-based, it's going to be uh, fossil fuel-based, unless a country decides to go nuclear or something like that. Uh, and um, um, and the and the banks that have um, that have decreased their fossil fuel commitments, uh, the uh, sure bank, by the way, the Russian bank, uh, spare bank, sorry, is one of the banks that has reduced its uh, fossil fuel financing uh, dramatically. One of the biggest uh, reduction in, in fossil fuel lending. Uh, I guess that was a conscious commitment before the war, uh, and then now we'll see uh, that maybe they, they will have to you know go back on that um, and. And the banks that have increased fossil fuel financing, um, many of them are in Asia. Um, you know, the Postal Savings Bank of China, China Minchin Bank, which, which by the way, I, I know quite well. Um, and then the, the banks that are, you know, very strong in emerging markets, like Standard Chartered Bank and so on. Um, so so this, this whole dimension of lending to fossil fuel lending, uh, 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 fossil fuel uh, projects and so on, uh, that's going to be, uh, pull back, I, I think, somewhat uh, in the next three to five years, not just in, in the, the two countries, Russia and Ukraine, but the residual countries that depend on these countries uh, uh, for oil. And also, um, the oil players themselves are going to be massively capitalized. So Saudi Arabia, for example, is looking at an inflow of um, funds, which is double what they had last year uh, from, from oil uh, receipts. So, um, so these countries will be able to um, you know, continue building infrastructure and so on and depend a lot more on the oil oil economy. Yeah, well, yes and no. I think the thing is that what has been happening over the last 20 years is that, if you like, it's a bit like greenwashing. The Europeans have sort of said, we will not invest in, we will not allow fracking, we will not invest in new gas production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then actually there was a, there was a good piece out by uh, Oak Tree Capital Management, and uh, uh, so that's uh, Howard Marks, and he, he was showing uh, that uh, Europe basically it produces three and a half million barrels of oil and it consumes 15 million. So it's got this 11 million deficit, uh, same sort of story in gas, same in coal. Uh, Russia's exactly the other way around. So what's happened over the last 20 years is Europe has said, oh, we're not going to produce gas and coal and all the rest of it. And they've just started importing more and more of it from Russia, which is why, exactly what which is why Western Europe has become so highly, heavily dependent on cheap Russian gas and oil. Right. And so if now they're saying strategically, we can't rely on this one supplier. Well, that, to your point, either Europe has to say, OK, so we've got to, you know, Norway can produce oil and gas again. Uh, or, you know, I mean, they will have to say that because they're going to have to find a way of replacing uh, Russian supplies and they're going to have to accelerate the energy transition. So, I mean, Germany is shutting down nuclear power plants. Russia's building more nuclear power plants so it could export more gas to Europe and increase that Western Europe uh, reliance on uh, Russian oil and gas exports that we now realize is, is a dangerous dependency. Because you, you know, if you if you build your entire economy on cheap Russian oil and gas, and then you realise that maybe they're not a reliable supplier, what do you do? So there's going to have to be a huge shift in the entire industrial structure of Europe and the entire uh, oil and gas market. Russia produces ten, roughly 10, 10.7 million barrels a day. I think the world consumes about a hundred million, and Russia exports about seven million. 
So at the moment, a, a lot of that goes to Europe. And the question is, obviously, China and India can take some, but the uh, pipeline infrastructure and so on isn't there for them to take all of it. So there's going to be major dislocations in, in European industry, uh, oil and gas policy, green transition, and maybe they'll need to turn on the nuclear power plants. And, and for a lot of countries, China especially, uh, oil and gas, and gas especially, uh, was a replacement of coal. So it, it's not even, um, you know, a transition. Yeah, so they're saying we're going to stop using coal and we're going to buy Russian gas. And then they find that they're totally dependent on imports of cheap Russian gas. And now that's a problem. So the, the question from the floor, and thank you for the for, for the questions that we're, we're, we're answering, although we're not always reading them out, was can Europe reduce its reliance on Russian energy and what are their options? And of course, the answer is it's very, very difficult. But they're going to have to, and that's going to that's going to cause shortages, price increases, uh, and having to rethink the whole uh, energy policy of Europe, which is pretty major, right? Okay, we've come to the end of the, you know the all of the areas that we can cover related to finance. Uh, just as a conclusion, really, uh, the the geopolitical implications of what we're seeing, um, who will be the winners and losers. Uh, you know, how should different countries, uh, you know, play, uh, you know, their role in, in these, or in, 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 these uh, uh, in the matters that are arising? Uh, what, what thoughts do you have, uh, Matthew? I, I, I think we're really still at the early stage of this, and, and we, we, we don't really know how it plays out. And a huge um, impact will be, does this war end quickly, uh, or is it protracted? Yeah, in fact, that is the big question right now, uh, which is, is this going to be a protracted war? Because if it is going to be a protracted war, uh, the world will, is going to be entering into a very different economic dimension. Uh, as, a, as a quick and dirty war, uh, it has its issues. And in fact, this particular briefing and discussion uh, is uh, based on, and this presentation, uh, based on, uh, on all of the elements of a quick and dirty war. But the moment it becomes a protracted war, and it's going to be too years or three years, uh, we, we then need to start taking into consideration uh, other issues. Uh, China, for example, uh, has already announced that its uh, annual GDP targets for this year, 5.5% or something like that, uh, it will have tremendous repercussions in the country, uh, you know, as an economy, as a, as a social political entity. Um, but if it is going to play, the, play its cards wrongly, and it falls even more, uh, that has even more repercussions on China, uh, on supply chain globally, and so on. But a lot of these things are there anyway, right? They're already baked into the cake. Because if, say, Mr. Putin uh, said, OK, sorry, I made a mistake. I'm going to withdraw. It's all over. Do you think Boris Johnson is going to say, oh, Roman, please take back your football club? I, th I think the train has left the station. Europe isn't going to go back to being totally dependent on Russian oil and gas, right? So a lot of these things, we've established that you can have 650 billion in reserves and they can be frozen. In fact, a lot of these things are that's what I'm getting, left the station. That's, that's what I'm getting from my... issues tomorrow, the world still is going to... That's catch. what I'm getting from my European friends, Matthew being the most European of them all, which is that uh, we're not going to forget this war. We're not going to forget Germany has uh, increased its uh, commitment to defense. We didn't talk about military. I mean, in, in two weeks, Mr. Putin has done more to strengthen the spine of NATO than eight American presidents in 50 years. The right. EU is reminded of why you want to be in it, right? So I think Europe has suddenly things are, Europe has suddenly woken up to the idea that we are not going to put up with uh, you know restrictive regimes. Uh, uh, you know we're not going to take it lightly. We're, we're not, uh, it's not going to be business as usual. And as the foreign minister of Singapore said the other day, uh, you can't have big countries just invade and conquer and annex little countries. Yeah, it, it, it would be a change in the entire post 1945 rules based global uh, 
system. So the countries that for the last 10 years have been uh, taking sort of a reticent view of uh, uh, geopolitics, uh, we will see them becoming more assertive uh, in, in the next, in the foreseeable future. Uh, so that's... But maybe in Asia, this has shown, for example, obviously China, Taiwan is the elephant in the room. And what this has shown is that war is really awful. And uh, it's a terrible thing. And it, it causes, you know, so many people's livelihoods have been destroyed by this thing. So I think it, we've all been reminded what we should have known all along, that peace and prosperity and, and stability and rules-based multilateral order are all important and worth preserving. Somehow we didn't see that when we watched the CNN videos of uh, the US uh, invasion of Baghdad you know, in 2003 and the bombs going in. We just, that, that we was, just didn't see that, that you know, was, weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so uh, comprehensively, I think uh, it creates a new morality, which is yes. that this behavior is unacceptable, unacceptable by unacceptable. any country. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, and finally, I, I want to say this, that what I've been looking out for uh, is that uh, this war has thrown up uh, a number of issues in, fi in the finance industry. I mentioned to you, the uh, we, we talked about the LME uh, episode uh, where they shut down the market for a whole day, uh, which questions the integrity of institutions, financial institutions, as we know them to be today. I think that that sets the stage and the excuse uh, for new players uh, to want to say, you know what, uh, we have a better way, a much more networked world where everyone is dependent on everyone else. Uh, we already are in that networked world. In fact, uh, that's what we see the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine looking like, because it's not a winner-take-all situation. It's like multiple winners, multiple losers uh, in the whole story. Uh, and I, I guess that we, I think in, in some ways, I, I would say, and remember I said this, the Russian-Ukraine war is the first war in the network era. Uh, that we are seeing. And, and it's introducing a number of elements uh, that are going to be, um, you know, uh, going to be normal uh, and going to be repeated uh, and built on uh, in the future. Uh, and the financial sector uh, cannot uh, be held ransom as it is right now, not just by Russia, uh, but also by the West in the way it's responding, um, you know, in, in a very casual way, saying, you know, we're going to hold out the reserves of a country and so on. Uh, and that uh, countries will start uh, looking for much more networked responses, uh, uh, you know, to create a more robust financial system that can uh, outbid, outstand, um, you know, um, crisis situations like this. So with these comments, okay, uh, I hope we had a good uh, discussion and uh, thank you all for the many questions. I think the impact is bigger than we think. Uh, I think that's broadly what you've been saying, right? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.